you get, you reach age, you know, 40, and you start to notice between 40, 41, 42, your sex drive starts to dip yeah, or starts your energy so starts to get lower. Mm -hmm. You know, you start, you know, developing maybe some depression. And that's aside from the fact that maybe you find it harder to lose weight, find it harder to gain muscle mass, but find it harder it, to retain but, muscle mass. But isn't that, uh, isn't that universal? For almost all men, <laughs> what which part is universal? All all the above. Uh, when, when, oh, the all those symptoms. Are. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. We'll all experience some degree of that. The question. Exactly. So again, the question. <laughs> so testosterone deficiency and androgen deficiency is 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 part of eight norm quote unquote normal aging. But as mm -hmm. you know, just because something's part of normal aging, yeah, it doesn't mean that we should. Doesn't mean that we exactly. have to live with it. Yeah. I have to make a confession that uh, until very recently, I was myself quite sure that testosterone is kind of semi-legal, dirty thing, which only extreme bodybuilders use. And sure. They pay with uh, side effects and uh, all kind of health issues. It's actually thanks, thanks to your channel, I've kind of realized that uh, the picture I had about testosterone is <laughs> upside down that extreme bad cases are on the sides, but if you do it carefully with, with details and nuances, uh, which hopefully we're going to discuss today, yeah. it's almost every man will, after a certain age, will benefit greatly. And it's not just uh, muscle mass, it's sex drive, it's uh, mental clarity, it's just zest for life. And uh, it's almost like... <laughs> Testosterone is eventually yeah. going to become a lot like postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy in women. <laughs> It yeah, used to be that. we were afraid of hormones and everybody, and then we found out hormones are beneficial for certain uh, age-related, you know, menopause being an age-related disease. Mm -hmm. Then we found out it's beneficial for people with symptoms. Then we found out it's beneficial even for women without symptoms. Now we found out it's beneficial even for a lot of the people that we thought couldn't take it, like certain cancer survivors other than breast cancer. Um, and it, like the indications for it are expanding and it's to the point where something like 90% of women should, pro should be on some form of estradiol replacement after or near menopause. Yeah, the same thing is going to happen health, I think, in health. men. Yeah. yeah. Same thing's going to happen in men, but the problem is in men, we're tied up with how to write guidelines in such a way that, mm -hmm. um, the, everybody's obsessed with the actual testosterone levels in the labs and they miss all the nuance of how people feel and from a physician standpoint it's actually a topic that number one you can make a lot of money doing it because every guy wants it these days but so that attracts a lot of bad actors and mm -hmm. a lot of incompetent people who are just there to make a living but yeah, and that's why we, actually, what we, that's what we hear yeah. Probably all the bad and cases. That's what you hear. It's true. But it's actually one of those things where the other thing that, that sucks about it is and it attracts people is it on this on the outside it seems so easy because it's just you're dealing with one drug and then maybe a very small handful of other drugs. And it's just like um, seems simple. The guidelines are written very very simply that even like a nurse practitioner or physician assistant can easily follow them but the guidelines obviously are written for non-experts and written in a w such a way that they're they're designed to minimize harm for the greatest amount of people mm -hmm. and that's their that's their primary benefit and then uh, you know so they're extraordinarily conservative and the, the whole topic is 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 much more complex um, than people realize, than even doctors realize. Yeah, it's, it's we'll probably, everything. When you start to dig deeper, you realize, oh, this nuance and that nuance and that oh, yeah. feedback. And uh, yeah, you're writing a sure. book on it, on the topic, on the, on the testosterone, testosterone. I am. I'm I'm writing a book on testosterone uh, therapy. I don't like calling it replacement therapy per se because it gives people the wrong idea that you have to. It gives people the the wrong idea that testosterone is not actually a drug. It's just something that it's not a drug that you can use to treat certain things and certain symptoms and cer even certain diseases like diabetes. And it's all about getting a level from 
200 to 500, you know, again, I think it just reinforces kind of a false conception of, of what it should be. But I'm writing a book on it. It's a it's supposed to be designed to be re read in two or three sittings. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm writing the book is I wanted to have something that doctors could give to their male patients that outlines not in the super dumbed down terms, but in like a let's say slightly above IQ, mm -hmm. you know, slightly above average IQ way, but very, you know, brief, you know, talks about the risks and benefits. And so the book's designed for a patient to read it and have all the information that they need to decide if it's right for them. Are we talking about just male audience here or women also should be on some testosterone at some point? Women can be on testosterone. I'm, I'm actually, um, in my area, the most experienced person prescribing testosterone to women and women the there's a there's big differences though women should be on testosterone specifically to alleviate symptoms of sexual dysfunction it's usually postmenopausal women that's right now the only evidence based indication to give it to women now again as we we're talking about there's a lot of scam clinics everywhere that'll give women yeah whatever they want testosterone the just because their testosterone levels are low so this is another harmful uh misconception people have because they think it's all about levels that a woman will go into her doctor have her testosterone levels checked and testosterone levels for women are like five to ten percent what they are for men and at, at which we may talk about the labs are not all that precise they they lack precision and they they lack um accuracy and so what i mean by that is I, you can draw a total testosterone level on a man in the morning, do it five minutes later, and it could be, you know, 50, 60, maybe even 100 points. It could be significantly different. Mm -hmm. And so when you're when you're looking at labs and women, it's even it's much more unreliable because you're dealing with much lower numbers overall. And then the second point is in women, it's actually there's no study that has ever shown that there's a certain level of testosterone at which treatment with testosterone will alleviate any kind of specific symptom. Um, so for example, like I said, it, it's the medical consensus is women with, um, with sexual dysfunction, low libido, testosterone's like a second line treatment. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very, very isn't the right word. It's an extraordinarily effective treatment if it's given in a compounded um, vaginally applied cream. Um, but the, the testosterone levels of a woman before she's on treatment and after she's on treatment have zero correlation with <laughs> her symptoms. Okay. That, absolutely zero. There's some women, if you just breathe on them a little bit with a little testosterone, mm -hmm. their libido goes through the roof. I, I mean, that's a minority of them, but there's some women that require like up to 25 30 percent of the starting male dose before they feel anything feel anything yeah. but they can go from feeling nothing to getting on the right dose six weeks later their libido is so high that they'll come into my office with their partner usually their husband you know because dealing in my area there's a lot of you know married a lot of older women are married so we use it mostly in postmenopausal women and their husbands will come in and be like she really needs to leave me alone. This is yeah, too yeah. much, so much. <laughs> needs to back off. And mm -hmm. of course I don't change anything based on just what the husband says, but you know, it, it, you know, if, if, if we, in other words, it can be a little bit too effective sometimes, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and what angry. about males? Um, because like, for example, let's say colonoscopy is recommended to everyone at a certain age, just start yep. to make sense to check yourself, have a baseline. Sure. Is there a certain yeah. age for men when to, to probably do a test to see what your level is? Just think, start thinking about it. Classically, it was said after age 40, um, this is classic epidemiologic studies, says that your testosterone level after about age 40 will drop by 1% to 2% a year. 
Uh, that's actually been revised down to about age 30. Your testosterone levels start to drop about 1% to 2% a year. And so I wouldn't say there's an age per se because in point of fact, there are many men in their 20s that have very serious metabolic problems. The biggest one that I deal with is diabetes, meaning diabetes and obesity. Diabetes and obesity, which we'll probably talk about, has a very complex relationship with androgen levels in males. It's very complex because obese men, especially who are diabetic, well over 50% of them will also meet the classic criteria for testosterone deficiency, meaning they'll have two early morning fasting total testosterone levels under 300. That's Mm -hmm. over 50% of of obese young men, even before they're 30, will have that. And and so um, when you ask what age should you be concerned about it, it's not so much an age. It's 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 more. Do you have signs and symptoms of symptoms. androgen deficiency? Mm-hmm. And, uh, what, what about like age? what about more like less more or less fit people? More or less fit people. Yeah. Um, Normal weight individuals who are healthy with no diseases should typically start to worry about it, I would say, after, uh, you know, I would say after about age 35. 35. Mm -hmm. However, again, it's it's new. Symptoms rule. (laughs) It's not about levels. So maybe it helps if I make this statement Mm -hmm. because it's a universal statement. I don't, but it's not a universal statement. There are exceptions to everything. For the vast majority of men who are healthy and don't have any kind of chronic disease, there's no specific age at which you should start to worry about your testosterone levels. Mm-hmm. You should start to worry about your testosterone levels if you develop signs and symptoms that could potentially be related to androgen deficiency and have no other obvious explanation. So the big so the easy one to say is like you get you reach age, you know, 40 and you start to notice between 40, 41, 42, your sex drive starts to dip yeah, or your energy so starts to get lower. Mm-hmm. You know, you start, you know, developing maybe some depression. And that's aside from the fact that maybe you find it harder to lose weight, find it harder to gain muscle mass, but find it harder it, to retain muscle mass. So isn't, it's that, not, uh, isn't that universal for almost all men? <laughs> it, uh, what which part is universal uh all all the above uh, when, when, oh, the all those you symptoms are. yes yeah yeah it is we'll all experience some degree of that the question exactly. so again the question <laughs> so testosterone deficiency and androgen deficiency is 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 part of a norm quote unquote normal aging but as mm-hmm. you know just because something's part of normal aging yeah it doesn't mean, doesn't that, we mean that we yeah. have to live with exactly. it yeah but yeah that is correct that most men will eventually experience those kinds of symptoms. Absolutely. But when should you worry about it? You should worry about it when you yourself develop uh, symptoms of testosterone deficiency and, you know, that are not clearly related to something else. If you have a lot, if fatigue is your only symptom, there's a million things that cause fatigue. If you go into your doctor and say, I have a lot of fatigue, check my testosterone levels, but we find out, you know, you have a hemoglobin of seven or eight, <laughs> you know, something like that. Well, maybe your fatigue's more related to the fact that you prof- have profound anemia. You know, most people with fatigue in general in a primary care clinic, they, there's no really obvious, readily identifiable cause. So I said that to say that's when levels come in because levels mm-hmm. tell you if not, something I mean, they tell you on. if it's more likely due to testosterone deficiency than not in the absence of other potential explanations. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah. But again, my light bulb moment was that actually that, that, that this decline we we're talking about is actually something treatable, fixable, and can in parallel improve a bunch of other stuff like energy, like let's say I'm personally struggling with get my A1C below a certain level, which sure. has no other explanation. I'm like, what's going on? Something is not right. Yeah. So I started to dig into all the hormonal stuff and then oh maybe i should pay attention to testosterone and then oh yes you actually can improve <laughs> all other symptoms which i was to this day sure that it's just normal process of aging but now yeah like, hmm, hold on a second you, you can things can and get better 
Yeah, yeah, you can, especially when it comes to metabolic disease and and diabetes and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you are testosterone deficient, you are going to progress to type two diabetes. If you're a pre-diabetic and you're at risk for diabetes and you live a long period of time with testosterone deficiency from any cause, doesn't matter if it's an age-related thing or it's because you're obese and you develop what's called functional hypogonadism, where yeah, there's a ke push. you know chemical interplay between the fact that you're obese and you know the function of your testicles that it, you know contributes to the low testosterone. It doesn't matter what the specific cause is, but if you correct that, mm -hmm. you know you uh, will have a. It lowers your risk of progression to diabetes. If you already have diabetes, it makes it much more likely that you can improve the diabetes or even revert it. The point I wanted to make with diabetes is basically that we now have several studies that show even in men with so-called normal testosterone levels who are mm -hmm. treated with testosterone, if they have pre-diabetes, meaning they have an A1C over 5.7%, or they're diabetic, it doesn't matter what their starting level of testosterone is. They will still benefit from testosterone therapy. There's at mm -hmm. least two major studies that have shown that. And the reason testosterone can improve a lot of chronic diseases is it mostly its effect on body composition. Yeah. Um, testosterone, more, more muscle mass, more better. Yep, testosterone, better even at mild doses, directly causes increased muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. At higher doses, it causes stem cell activation and you know, recruit, you know, recruitment of new muscle cells. Which that's one of the reasons bodybuilders use like five to 10 times the dose that we typically use in TRT clinics. Mm -hmm. But um, so it, it directly has an effect to in, increase your muscle mass. It has a direct effect to decrease both subcutaneous and visceral fat. As you know, visceral fat, the fat that surrounds your internal organs, that's the type of fat that's yeah. highly associated Toxic. with chronic disease and more rapid aging. Testosterone mm -hmm. reduces visceral fat. It does so through estradiol, which is a metabolite of testosterone. Um, and then the third thing it, that testosterone does for your body composition is it directly increases your bone density. Mm -hmm. It has direct effects to increase bone density, but that's also, at least in part, an estradiol effect too. And I say estradiol effect because Testosterone gets metabolized into estradiol, and uh, you know some of it gets metabolized into dihydrotestosterone or DHT, mm -hmm. and those hormones have separate effects and different effects targets of... all over the you know different cellular effects all over the body. So, so, so what else testosterone is doing in the body? What else is it doing in the body? There's a, a whole laundry list of things that testosterone does to, because testosterone is the main hormone that causes masculinization of the brain in utero. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing testosterone does in your life is it it sensitizes you, uh, you know, it, it gives you sex specific sensitization to androgens and estrogens later in life. So that's the first thing it does. It, it It's what makes you a man. And then at puberty, it's what gives you your secondary sexual characteristics, facial hair, you know, facial, you know, structure. Um, it also plays a role in height, estradiol more so, but obviously in men, most of their estradiol comes from testosterone. So really when you're talking about endogenous testosterone, you're all, you know, meaning the testosterone you make um, just in your, in your own body, not actual like injecting yourself with it every time you talk about testosterone you have to talk about the effects of estradiol too as well so it, it regulates your your sex drive it has regulates your mood you know mm -hmm. it has effects in certain parts of the brain on dopamine sensitivity and that's largely what uh you know plays a role in, in mood and partly a role in energy levels and and function um you know, and then all the effects that it has on body composition too. So, increased muscle, decreased sub Q and visceral fat, increased bone density, things mm -hmm. like that. So, is that elevation in the mood? Is it uh, like a biofeedback from testosterone converting to estradiol and then just signaling to your brain? Yeah, a lot of life is good. Yep, some of the effects. So, testosterone can it will improve mood. 
the studies on testosterone and the treat and the treatment of you know depression things like that it's obviously it's an adjunct treatment to other you know anti depression treatments um but even if you're not on other anti depression treatments and you're depressed testosterone does have a mood benefiting effect um but the studies have only really been done in men with very low testosterone levels so that's not the mood is one area where we can't definitively say that anybody who gets testosterone is going to suddenly you know feel a, a lot better in terms of their mood but especially if your testosterone levels are low to begin mm-hmm. with you know um you will you will probably benefit it's very likely that you'll benefit i think we need to sort of explain to our listeners the whole ex- testosterone how it's called axis Right. Okay. From the brain to how it's get converted. You already said DHT and estradiol. Your your brain releases certain signals to to your testes to produce testosterone. Mm-hmm. Okay, it does that through hormones called LH and FSH, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and, and that's what causes you to increase your serum levels of testosterone. Once testosterone enters the bloodstream. Some of it gets converted to estradiol, some of it gets converted to DHT, mm-hmm. and then the three of these hormones have separate effects all, all over the body. And if you, you know, it, it's hard to really just say testosterone does A, B, C, and D, because testosterone and all androgens and all hormones have pleiotropic effects, meaning they affect thousands of different mm-hmm. processes in your, in your body and the timing of thousands of different cellular processes. So the more i guess useful way to talk about the effects of testosterone is what happens when you have testosterone deficiency whether that be you produce very low amounts of testosterone or testosterone functional deficiency can also be that you have what's called reduced androgen receptor sensitivity meaning that even though you have quote unquote normal levels of testosterone yeah, the just don't testosterone <laughs> itself does not interact as efficiently with its receptor mm-hmm. such that the intended or expected effects of testosterone are are blunted to the point where you start to develop symptoms even in the absence of having low serum levels so and it's almost that, like an like an insulin resistance you can have a testosterone resistance correct you, have, mm-hmm. you can have testosterone resistance yes that you absolutely can Another thing that can happen which is becoming more and more of a, an area of study is we have various things in our environment phytoestrogens and and various things that also affect testosterone's interaction with its mm-hmm. you know extracellular and intracellular uh receptors and also you know various chemicals and things in our environment that can even if it doesn't affect testosterone's interaction with its receptors may affect the um downstream you know how testosterone promotes the transcription basically the the building of certain proteins there're like uh, you know dozens of biochemical steps in there that various chemicals can interfere with and obviously the problem with that is we can never measure that <laughs> there's no real way to measure that the only way to figure that out is by someone having s- symptoms and then giving them testosterone and then obviously giving them testosterone overcomes past a certain point overcomes the deficit at least in part and you see there these specific symptoms improve so what are the physical signs and symptoms of testosterone deficiency the um american urologic association lists three separate domains of symptoms the first there would be like physical signs and symptoms so it'd be like reduced energy reduced endurance they put diminished work performance which i think that takes to mean attentional issues and like mm-hmm. motivation that plays a role in like motivation and attention and yeah, so if those things start to decline that can be a symptom diminished physical performance obviously that's a muscle thing like if you're start, if you're losing muscle mass over time obviously you can't lift weights as much or you can't you know you you have lower overall endurance other physical signs would be like reduced hair in certain androgen dependent parts of the body so in males it'd be the face you know reduced beard growth technically can be a symptom of testosterone deficiency we we already talked about fatigue in general 
um, reduced lean muscle, reduced lean mass. And, you know, another physical sign and symptom is obesity. If you're overweight, and especially if you're obese, that's a very, very good sign that you're probably also androgen deficient. So that's the first domain. The second domain would be cognitive symptoms. So that'd be like depression, uh, just cognitive dysfunction, reduced motivation, poor concentration, uh, poor memory, uh, irritability. Okay, so more difficult mood regulation. You get irritated more often. You get um, you know emotional more often. That kind of thing. It's actually one of the great myths in a lot of people. They think that. And I don't know if this would be appropriate for your audience, but like there's a lot of bodybuilders that believe when they start to experience a lot of mood swings, that's related to estrogen. Their estrogen levels are too high, so they need to lower their estrogen. No, in a lot of men, especially men who are, you know, well, not especially, but men who are not on testosterone, irritability, mood swings can it by itself just be a symptom of testosterone deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, so and then the third domain of symptoms would be sexual symptoms. So that would be primarily reduced sex drive and reduced erectile erectile function or erectile dysfunction. So that, that would also be a symptom. So those are the three dom domains mm -hmm. of symptoms. And if you have any one of those symptoms and they're not clearly due to anything else, and you're usually in an age range where we think, you know, that testosterone deficiency is a lot more common. This would be particularly if you're age 40 and older, mm -hmm. you know, then it's, uh, that's something you need to have investigated. So uh, let's say I go and investigate. Well, I just did. And okay. my blood, I got my blood lab results. And what I see there is total testosterone. I see free testosterone. I see binding globulin. I see yep. albumin and uh, DHA, DHA. Sure. DHA. So sex. What, what, what are they each? Like, what's the difference between total and free? So the difference between total testosterone and free testosterone is the total testosterone is the sum amount of testosterone that's in your bloodstream at any given time. That includes the testosterone that is uh, bound. bound to albumin, which is mm -hmm. a ma the main protein circulating in the blood. Yep. And um, that also includes testosterone bound to a protein called sex hormone binding globulin. And then it also includes testosterone that's just freely floating in the bloodstream. That's the free testosterone fraction. Free testosterone is the active hormone active. testosterone. Yep. The testosterone that is bound to sex hormone binding globulin is not available to actually interact with its receptor. It's sequestered and held mm -hmm. onto. So that's so when we measure total testosterone, that's not the all that active doesn't include component. all the active testosterone. Mm -hmm. It's the free testosterone, which can be, you know, one, two, three percent of your yep. total testosterone. So we more care more about free. Is that what you're saying? We care more about free testosterone. Well, I would say over. So overall, as a as an expert on testosterone, what I would say mm -hmm. is we don't care as much about levels as as you would think in general but mm -hmm. to the extent that we care about levels we care much more about the free testosterone levels than the total testosterone levels because as i said number one it's the free levels that are the biologically mm -hmm. active mm -hmm. yep. uh, fraction of the hormone but also number two the studies have shown that free testosterone levels correlate much more closely with symptoms than with total symptoms. testosterone levels. Well, makes sense. If now, active. the correlation, it's important to say that the correlation is not um, as strong as you would think or hope it to be. Or hope, yeah. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, but free testosterone levels are more uh, 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 associated with, with having the symptoms that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So... And then sex, we, sex hormone binding globulin is like what I said. It's a protein that sequesters the active testosterone. A lot of people think sex hormone binding globulin is bad. And if you have a lot of SHBG, um, that that's bad because obviously that limits the pool of active Afraid. testosterone mm -hmm. that you have. The problem with that is <laughs> in pretty much every epidemiologic study that's ever been done, 
sex hormone binding globulin, the lower your SHBG level is, the higher your risk for various chronic diseases. So SHBG has a lot of biologically active effects that we don't even know yet, but mm -hmm. I have a feeling, you know, a lot of SHBG is, you know, has direct regulatory effects on pathways that affect, you know, underlying metabolic health too. So having low SHBG is not necessarily a, a good thing. So as usual, we need a balance. Yes. And then, you know, you measure things like LH and FSH. Mm -hmm. LH and FSH, you could, you could get into a three-day lecture talk just on the, those hormones alone, but the part that's relevant for your audience is just to know that your LH and FSH are, are kind of what helps your doctor determine whether you have what's called primary hypogonadism, mm -hmm. meaning or you have primary testosterone deficiency, I guess, is the, to, to not make it confusing with more terms. Mm -hmm. But the LH and FSH tell you if it's a, if you have low testosterone primarily because your brain doesn't tell your testes to make testosterone. Low signal. Or if your testes are not producing testosterone on their own. So that would be called like testicular failure. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really the only thing I, you, you would need to know about that. DHEA is a downstream hormone, which that is another hormone with a billion different nuances. And, and uh, we, we don't really know exactly a lot of what DHEA does. The, the DHEA uh, and its interplay with testosterone is simply that if you have very, very low DHEA levels, that is associated with difficulty retaining muscle mass. Mm -hmm. It's not a testo it's not primarily a testosterone mediated thing. It's just more an association. The big thing with DHEA is there's a misconception that by taking DHEA it will raise your testosterone levels because some of DHEA gets converted into testosterone. Um, and in the US, DHEA is a supplement you can go buy at Walgreens. In a lot of other countries, DHEA is actually a controlled substance, believe it or not. DHEA, when women take it, does increase their testosterone levels. When men take it, it does not, it definitely doesn't increase it to a significant, usually even detectable amount. Estrogen levels in, in healthy adolescent males, uh, well, I should say in healthy young postpubertal males, so early 20s, you know, late teens, somewhere in the range of 75 to 85, maybe even 90 uh, or excuse me, it's more like 15%, 10%, I was getting the numbers backwards, of your total testo testosterone gets converted into estradiol. So mm -hmm. the reason to check estradiol in men that you suspect may have testosterone deficiency, believe it or not, the only reason to check estradiol is, again, you're looking for what the cause of the testosterone deficiency may be. And if someone has very low testosterone levels, but very high estradiol levels, that can be, yeah, that can be a sign that they have some kind of tumor that secretes estradiol. And then, mm -hmm. you know, um, obviously, if you have a bunch of estradiol, that can cause hypogonadism because estradiol is actually a more potent inhibitor of the mechanisms in the brain that tell your testes to release testosterone. So it's like a back mechanism to tell enough, enough. Correct. The key thing with, with estradiol is it's the levels of that a male that's not on testosterone has of estradiol are not important at all unless mm -hmm. they are very, 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 very profoundly elevated. Mm -hmm. Then it makes you maybe look for like a, a an estradiol secreting tumor. But beyond that, your estradiol levels are not important. Another factor with testosterone is receptor sensitivity. There are tests now that allow us to measure what are called CAG, C-A-G, repeats. So basically, the length of the gene that makes the, and the androgen receptor that testosterone interacts with, if you have a lot of those C-A-G repeats, meaning the gene is much longer, mm -hmm. that is that indicates that your receptor is not as sensitive to testosterone. Whereas if you have very short CAG, a, a small amount of CAG repeats, you have much higher sensitivity. So what the relevance of that is, if you have high receptor sensitivity, your 
testosterone levels can be low, but you could have no symptoms just because the testosterone very efficiently interacts with its receptor. On the other hand, you can have normal levels of testosterone, like even in the middle level of the normal range. But if you have some genetic predisposition where you have a lot of these CAG repeats, meaning you have a profound um, receptor insensitivity, well, you know, even normal testosterone levels, you're going to have deficiency just because it doesn't interact as well. Properly. With Does it receptor. happen often, those mutations or variations? Um, they are... I, and I wouldn't, I don't know that I would call them mutations. It's really just, it's, it's individual genetic predisposition. African-American men, for, for example, are, have been shown to, ha to typically have higher receptor sensitivity because they have sh a shorter number of CAG repeats, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, Caucasian individuals tend to have longer repeats, so they have, you know, can have less, sens less sensitive, or, or, yeah, more insensitivity, I guess, In would be the way to say it. But so, uh, I'm talking about still large. Oh, large how fraction. common is it to have yeah. receptor insensitivity? Yeah, yeah. I we don't really know how common it is because mm -hmm. it's not it's it's only really measured as of right now in in research settings. So it's not a widely available test that your doctor can can measure. So we don't know. So normally, your first line is to try to push on different levels of testosterone production. Right, either through signaling or direct replacement, and then you see what happens. What happens with the symptoms? So what happens is if you if you maybe if you start with a patient, a guy, let's say forty year old guy comes into the mm -hmm. office, he says, "My sex drive is low. I'm depressed. Yeah, yeah. I'm very fatigued." Mm -hmm. Okay, that the first thing you say as a physician is, he has symptoms of testosterone deficiency. We don't yet know if they're due to testosterone deficiency, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. but that but he ha he at least has symptoms consistent with it so then we check the labs mm -hmm. if the labs come back and the testosterone level is very profoundly low and when i say profoundly low what i really mean is compared to other healthy men his age mm -hmm. his testosterone levels are within the five ten tenth percentile at the low you know low range okay, okay. Then we say to ourselves, okay, he has symptoms and his levels are highly suggestive that the cause of those symptoms mm -hmm. is the testosterone itself. So that's what really can, happens in clinical okay, practice. Okay, so can, 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 can we put some numbers to this? Just to yeah, sure. So total testosterone in nanograms per deciliters is probably the most common, common, yep, uh, yep. With, uh, most common units. So the AUA says testosterone deficiency just purely from a biochemical standpoint is when you have at least two separate early morning meaning between 8 a.m and 11 a.m overnight fasting total testosterone levels that are under 300 nanograms per deciliter and it has to be on at least two separate readings the endocrine society prefers that you do three separate readings and they all have to be under 300 meaning that if you have one level that's 289, one level that's 254, and then according to the endocrine society, the next level is 320, it doesn't matter what your symptoms are, you don't have testosterone deficiency. Mm -hmm. Here's an antidepressant, here's a weight loss drug, here's a whatever, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. for whatever they think your symptoms are really due to, but it's, they say it's not the testosterone, you're fine, go away. What about free testosterone? Free testosterone is highly dependent on the specific lab that you use. Free testosterone would be, you're asking me when free testosterone is, is considered low. It depends on what the specific scale it is. Just usually if it's below the lower limit of normal according to the specific lab range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we've, I think, established before that free testosterone is more correlated with symptoms. Correct. It make more sense to look at your free testosterone and then make a sort of clinical decision based on that rather than total. Correct. So if your free test, yeah, if your free testosterone is low, according to the the lab the lab range, you know mm -hmm. that is, uh, like I said, I guess uh, more 
associated with symptoms, but I, I can't give you a certain number where it's considered okay. considered low exactly. It's just it's more so to do with the the actual scale that that's used itself. Is that like a, you mentioned a certain percentage, like below two percent or yeah, two two percent, one percent. Mm -hmm. things like that. But again, it's not a, a standardized thing. Because another thing that complicates this is there's a, a lot of different ways to measure testosterone, to measure, which yes. have varying sensitivities. At least it should be consistent uh, when testing yourself yeah. using the same lab. Correct. Yeah, you want to use the same lab and also the same, the, the same method of measuring free testosterone, because free testosterone is calculated it's based calculated. on... Yeah, it's calculated based on your on albumin and your SHBG levels. Yeah. It's almost like cholesterol. Yeah, it's free testosterone. But if you're if you're just using the a standard uh, lab assay, free testosterone should be somewhere between 0.3 and two percent of total testosterone levels. But some mm -hmm. people consider even one percent to be very low. Um, but that's yeah. the range. So that mm -hmm. that translates to a level of between five and 25 nanograms per deciliter. Okay. Op optimal would be, I would say, at least 2% of your total testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the labs are not the end all be all, but yeah. Because of the sensitivity and saturation, uh, definitely symptoms have played much more clinical role. They play a much more clinical role. And the reason why the symptoms are important is because, like I said, the labs are, they do not correlate as well with symptoms as, as we would hope, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes especially true when you're on treatment because you could, you could go from a testosterone level of, of total testosterone level of 200 and, you know, get it up to 400. But mm -hmm. your sim depending on the specific symptoms you have, them, it, you're, you may not, uh, your symptoms may not necessarily improve. improve. So if you use the example of like depression, for example, if that's your primary symptom and you go from 200 to 400 and you don't, you still feel just as depressed, it's probably because the amount of testosterone that you need to, you know, get you know, changes in very in yeah. specific parts of the brain and dopamine sensitivity and things like that, it needs to be much higher to fix that specific yeah. symptom. Yeah, there, is, so there might be a threshold uh, which you need to cross to maybe get Yeah, there, to there's clearly a threshold effect for correction of different symptoms, but that threshold mm -hmm. has a great deal of both inter-individual, both in, inter-individual and intra-individual differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so. it makes sense again, because if you have your own sort of resistance and saturation point, uh, to the free testosterone, then yeah, everyone is going to be different. Exactly, exactly. So let's talk about, I guess, optimization and what can be done to improve your levels from starting from naturally to all the way pharmaceutically and everything sure. in between. Sure. So let so let's say you let's say you have low testosterone levels. Okay, and I always and do you in, have some symptoms uh, in quotes. Let's say yeah. Let's let's say. Yeah, let's say you have you have low testosterone levels and you have uh, symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that people will be tempted to do is, what can I do to naturally raise my testosterone level? Because I don't want to inject testosterone. I don't want to take any drugs. I just want to, mm -hmm. can I, through lifestyle, like you can lower your blood pressure by making certain lifestyle changes. Yep. You know, you can even to some extent lower your cholesterol levels by making certain dietary changes. Mm -hmm. When it comes to testosterone, yes, there are things you can do to, to raise your testosterone levels. Lose weight yep. is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, more physical exercise, especially resistance training and weightlifting has been shown to, to raise testosterone levels. The big thing is is correction of your underlying you know metabolic metabolic issues. disease yep and probably sleep plays a huge role sleep plays a massive role S sleep plays a massive role so especially correction of any sleep breathing disorders like obstructive sleep apnea mm -hmm. um you correct that your testosterone levels can go up too making the the traditional lifestyle changes that we say to everybody with any kind of disease is you know get better sleep lose weight lift weights, those things will all tend to raise your testosterone levels. 
The issue is this, though. Let's say you, your primary signs and symptoms of testosterone deficiency are you're obese and you're diabetic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Making those lifestyle changes and becoming less obese and less diabetic, yeah, your total testosterone levels will, will go up a little bit. And there are a lot of studies where they look at men with just diabetes and obesity. One, one group is given testosterone and put on a diet and put on an exercise program. The other group is just put on a diet and an exercise program. You look at the groups a year later, the, the group obviously on the testosterone will, will have experienced you know, increased testosterone levels. Yep. The group that's not on testosterone will also have increased testosterone levels just from the weight loss. Mm -hmm. The difference between those two groups is the ones that are on testosterone, they lose, they tend to lose, more. number one, more fat mass. Mm -hmm. But crucially, they also tend to either retain or gain muscle mass. Mm -hmm. The group that's not on testosterone, yes, their testosterone levels get higher. Yes, they lose a little bit of fat mass. But they also usually lose a very significant amount of muscle mass as well. So I said that to say that just correct, if you're obese and diabetic, just, just through lifestyle, yes, you can increase your testosterone levels, but not to a degree or in a way that will prevent loss of muscle. And so if you don't prevent the loss of muscle mass with the fat loss, that makes it much, much more likely that you are going to regain that weight. And I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of the data on just weight loss and dieting. Most people regain weight, they lose. Mm -hmm. So testosterone's role in obesity and, and diabetes really is, you, it helps accelerate the weight loss at, and it helps build the muscle mass. The more muscle mass you have, the higher your resting metabolic rate, the easier it is to, to, keep it, to keep your maintain weight that weight loss. So those lifestyle changes, yes, they do increase your testosterone levels, but in the case of obesity, it, it does not increase your testosterone levels enough to preserve the beneficial components of body composition. But what if you're talking about uh, not obese uh, or diabetic people, just again? Not obese, not diabetic people? Yeah, somebody who exercises uh, kind of has a reasonable diet, maybe a little bit extra body fat, but, uh, you know, nothing to worry about too much okay uh, sure so re so correcting testosterone levels in the setting of being a normal weight individual we we don't really know that it, we know this for sure okay we don't know that it's the same thing with patients with diabetes where they just end up losing a lot of muscle mass if they're not on testosterone even if their testosterone levels go up mm -hmm. in normal weight individuals it's likely the same thing but we just don't have the data that just the lifestyle changes really raise your testosterone levels uh, enough right. to, to have a muscle preserving effect. So I would suspect it's probably the same to a, to a, it, it's probably not to the great, it, to, it's probably not to the same extent as the obese individuals, but I would think that, yeah, it probably does play a role in that just the lifestyle factors will increase your testosterone, but not enough to preserve your, your muscle mass over time. In other words, Aging is an inflammatory disease that will lower directly lower your muscle mass, separate of any kind of metabolic disease you have, just being on planet Earth for a long oh, yeah. enough period of time. <laughs> so testosterone corrects disease-related muscle loss and age-related mm -hmm. muscle loss. Fixing your own endogenous testosterone levels will correct any kind of disease-related muscle loss that you may have, but it, it doesn't really combat the aging component. That makes yes, sense. Yeah, oh, yeah, obviously. No, but what I'm thinking is like, let's say we have somebody 40 years old. Uh, he just had kids, peak of his career, not sleeping enough, uh, maybe not exercising enough. And uh, if you even take age component away, your testosterone can drop to like, let's say 300. Sure, and if sure. If you're going to improve okay. your sleep a little more and go to gym a little more often, and whatever, and what they say, lift heavy, whatever that heavy means, I'm not quite sure. Oh, I, but okay. What, now what, I, what kind of changes you can see, let's say, from Now I know what to, you're asking. You're, you're yeah. saying, will it correct uh, this? It, it's all about whether it corrects the specific symptoms that you have. So mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're doing all the things, you're not getting a good enough sleep because you're taking care of the kids or working 80 hours a week, 
changing your lifestyle factors and improving your sleep will raise your testosterone levels. Whether it raises it enough mm -hmm. yes. is dependent on it. Are those symptoms any, are they improved? So if you have a lot of fatigue or low energy or attention issues, you fix your sleep, your testosterone level goes up and you have more energy, less fatigue. Yeah, I guess you could say that the lifestyle efforts worked because your symptoms improved. That's really how you, how you say it. It, it. it would be highly individualistic. But for people that want to just try that before testosterone, that's perfectly fine to do, but then you want to take an inventory of how much fatigue and how low your energy is and your work performance and stuff. If after three months of lifestyle changes, all those things are dramatically improved, well, you've, correct, you've corrected the issue and no problem. But in that case, we, was, did, were you really testosterone deficient to begin with? Maybe you were, and, the, <laughs> well, and may, you know, because, you know, obviously when you say something like you have a lot of fatigue, but you're not sleeping, not not sleeping as well will lower your testosterone levels but it should but it's just like yeah so now i get more sleep i'm not as fatigued like was it really a testosterone issue or just like primarily a sleep issue i mean it's these things are obviously like very highly interrelated but the key thing is with lifestyle is did it correct did, did your symptoms improve with those lifestyle things I'm not sure that if that if that's if you're convinced you don't want to go on testosterone before you try lifestyle interventions, I'm not really sure you even need your testosterone levels measured. Just make the lifestyle changes, see if it improves, and if they don't improve, then go get your levels checked. You know what I mean? Okay. I understand the numbers don't tell the story, but if let's say you have all this bad lifestyle and your testosterone is at say let's say three hundred, okay, what can you expect to see just number wise is it going to be 400 or is it going to be 800 you know any any data on that uh, like how profound of a difference it can make no no real good uh data to that i can point to okay well let's continue on this letter let's i don't say know if that was a satisfactory answer but it's i guess we don't have enough data to say we and just then, don't we just we just don't have enough data to say but it does make a lot of sense, uh, even if you did a lab, te lab test and your testosterone is low, you probably first should address your sleep. At least make sure that you're sleeping good seven, eight hours and waking up uh, on your own most of the time, well rested. Absolutely. Then it, and then Absolutely. Say, All right. Yeah, f fix any obvious thing. If you're not getting enough sleep, get enough sleep and see what that does, regardless yeah, of what you're testosterone levels are, I guess, but if, if that's your only symptom. So let's say you're sleeping okay, eating okay, still have some symptoms of low testosterone. What about supplements? Uh, like market is filled with a lot of kind of shilat, tonkat, alley, some other stuff, combination of those. Uh, do they have any? The vast majority of supplements like tonkat, ali, terkesterone, mm -hmm things like that, there are studies showing that these supplements will very modestly, mildly, potentially increase your total testosterone levels. Again, highly, there's a very high individual differences with that, mm -hmm. but there are no outcome data to show that even that mild increase has any actual benefits or improvements in any symptoms of in testosterone symptoms. deficiency. And by the way, that's the same with a lot of testosterone um, prescription drugs that are designed to raise your endogenous levels of testosterone as well, is just because something raises your testosterone levels does not mean that it has the same outcome mm -hmm. as using exogenous testosterone. So if you take a, a guy with levels of 200 or whatever, and give him whatever supplement you want, terkestrone, you know. Yep. Um, so there are some research peptides that they claim increase testosterone levels. If you take two, two people with the exact same symptoms, take them from 200 to 500, one person you use Tonkat Ali, the other person mm -hmm. you use purely testosterone, and you correct both of these individuals from 200 to 500, there's absolutely no evidence that with the supplement, induced rise in testosterone that you're going to fix any of their symptoms 
Whereas with the using exogenous testosterone, particularly if it's injectable testosterone, that has outcome data that that will improve certain metabolic parameters. That's likely to improve certain symptoms if you get to certain, you know, it's not really about the absolute levels, but more so the amount that you increase it in that specific individual. So yeah, more of the story is even if something raises your testosterone levels, that does not mean that it has the same outcomes as testosterone. So is it because we don't have enough studies or because they just don't work as well? Yeah, it's all the, the answer with testosterone is, is almost always we just don't have we just don't have enough studies. Mm -hmm. That's that's that that's really the answer. Uh, the ones that we do have studies on are not promising for any kind of supplement, though. So you, you, I guess you can try, but don't expect too much. Don't expect too much, even if the numbers change. You, mm -hmm. you, sh you shouldn't necessarily expect too much. I would say correcting your testosterone lifestyle has, a be has better evidence than any kind of non-testosterone supplement or even drug, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. other oh, than yeah, testosterone. Yeah, yeah directly. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want to see some real results, it's almost always first lifestyle, then you probably need to go to some sort of medication. Then and... you maybe want to go, then you may, if, if the lifestyle doesn't work, then generally you want to get on testosterone unless there's a reason you 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 don't want to be on testosterone the big one is you want to preserve your fertility in that mm -hmm. case you don't want to jump on a supplement you may consider jumping on um you know one of the drugs like hcg human chorionic gonadotropin um okay. Okay. or things like clomiphene i mean i don't use clomiphene there's something called n-clomiphene yeah. so let, let's talk the difference between them Sure. They, they sure. all kind of push, as far as I understand, push the signals from your head to your testicles to produce more, just in different uh, ways, right? Yeah, sure. So, so we talked about the supplements and how they raise testosterone. We don't really know how a lot of supplements do it. The way that so, for what's a dr a non testosterone drug that can raise your testosterone levels? Classic one is HCG. HCG, the way that it works is it's very similar to luteinizing hormone or LH. So LH is what, you know, is produced by the brain that tells your testes to make more testosterone. HCG has this effect where it, it, it's very structurally similar to LH. So it binds LH receptors in the, in the testicles, in the on Leydig cells in the testicles. And so it stimulates you to produce testosterone much like natural LH would do. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of using HCG over regular, you know, over exogenous testosterone is that HCG does not have, does not reduce your fertility. Because mm -hmm. what happens when yeah, you take... It, yeah, yeah, you signal from the brain. Correct. So you're just, you, you're just using the same kind of like trophic signals from your, your brain. You're taking advantage of the fact that HCG can bind to LH receptors and mm -hmm. cause the same thing that LH does and you produce more testosterone levels naturally. Yeah, if you have the capacity. Correct, so, so HCG will increase your testosterone levels. There's some low quality, not high quality evidence that the HCG induced increase in testosterone levels is associated with alleviation of some but not all symptoms of testosterone deficiency. And the reason I say some is lack of studies. So okay. when you look at- It doesn't increase as high as to those thresholds we mentioned. Before. Correct. It, it, it does not increase it as high as obviously exogenous testosterone. Or as, it, when I say exogenous, I mean just injectable testosterone mm -hmm. will and increase it to a, to a lower extent but um, it, but it will increase it, and there is some evidence that it can uh, play a role in improving some testosterone deficiency related symptoms. The cardinal one that we look at is just how it has effects on body composition, because mm -hmm. like I said, even at low doses of testosterone, over long periods of time, you'll see muscle mass increase slightly, and you'll see fat mass decrease slightly. So oh, it's a big one. Yeah, it, it is a big one, but it's a dose dependent effect with testosterone. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, you'll get improvement that is significant enough to detect with statistical testing with just HCG, but you will, you know, will not get 
as much as of an increase as with regular testosterone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's not enough data to say that hcg exactly has the same okay um you know symptom relieving effects as testosterone is it is it injectable hcg or is it a pill hcg is injectable in the united injectable. states it comes in a the brand name pregno which is mm -hmm. made by merck because it's a fertility drug for females it's a fertility drug. yep yep so it's it's injected it can be injected intramuscularly but the way that we our you know expert clinics do it these days is subcutaneously so it's injectable so yeah so it's a sub you the way to do it is a subcutaneous injection and there's a lot of different protocols for how much you should use do you need to pulse it or it's just once a week thing Any... uh, yeah there's a lot of different um <laughs> some experts think you need to use it every day because LH, mm -hmm. you know, and you need to try to mimic your natural circadian rhythm. So you want to mm -hmm. inject it every morning, a certain number of IUs. Some people say once a week and you inject significantly more. Some people say every other day. Some people say twice a week. Uh, that explains why, why we don't have that much data to compare because it's all different protocols. It's all, <laughs> it's all different protocols. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all different protocols. One thing that is very important to mention is in the US, HCG is almost is not covered by insurance for mm -hmm. for male testosterone deficiency. That's number one. Number two, it is pretty fairly expensive because you have to get the brand name product now. Yep. You used mm -hmm. to be able to get HCG from compounding pharmacies very cheap. Mm -hmm. Merck had a bunch of lawsuits and now the FDA has ruled that compounding pharmacies can no longer make HCG. So you have to spend, if you want to get a 10,000 international unit vial of, of mm -hmm. HCG, you know, that can cost you about $300. Is it like a month's supply? Well, again, it depends on how much you use, but yeah, for yeah, most but generally. For for most people that are being that it's being used for hypogonadism, you may use anywhere mm -hmm. in the range of fifteen hundred to three thousand to even you know higher than that a week. So you imagine a ten thousand IU vial, you know, may not even last you a, an entire month. Okay. Yeah, so that, that you're not, talking not not cheap if you want to be on it for life. Definitely not not cheap. Yeah. yeah. Not so cheap. what about the, I think the most popular or mostly mentioned is Clomid and mm -hmm. uh, you, you said you don't like it because what side effects or? Well, Clomid I don't like because Clomiphene gets metabolized. It, it has different metabolites. Mm -hmm. So the main thing that Clomiphene does is it blocks estrogen receptors in the brain. It's called the selective estrogen receptor module. So biofeedback is not working properly. Well, what it does, what it does is estradiol, Again, it causes your brain to release less LH and FSH. So what clomiphene does is it blocks that the brain receptors that estrogen would downregulate those hormones and causes your LH and FSH to increase. Right. And if those increase, then your testosterone levels increase because the more LH you have, the more it stimulates the, more the testes yep. to make testosterone. Problem with regular clomiphene is it gets metabolized into something called zooclomiphene, which has estrogenic effects. And this is kind of paradoxical because you think that, you know, by increasing testosterone levels, you get an increase in libido. With clomiphene, very often you can cause very profound <laughs> decreases Decrease. in sex drive. Yeah, because you're blocking your brain from the effects. Correct. Right? Correct. So how they've gotten around that estrogenic metabolite is they've made enclomiphene enclomiphene okay which does not get metabolized in that so that just purely blocks that you know it's just an increases lh and fsh mm -hmm. and therefore increases testosterone in the case of enclomiphene there's also data that by correcting your testosterone with with that drug you will improve some but not all mm -hmm. domains and symptoms of testosterone deficiency and then obviously you won't raise your testosterone levels anywhere near the same degree as oh, yeah, as, a, uh, as, a as regular testosterone, you know, but again, the, the, another benefit of it is your fertility gets preserved. So I don't know if you want me to talk about that, but the HCG clomiphene and clomiphene does not reduce your fertility because mm -hmm. it, it's an LH it effect on the testes. It stimulates, it stimulates your testes. Yeah. 
versus testosterone actually suppresses. So testosterone suppresses your intratesticular levels of testosterone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, so the testosterone that's made in the testes, just naturally when you're not on any kind of treatment, some of it gets into the bloodstream. A lot of it also stays in the testes and it's the, te it's the testosterone that stays in the testes mm -hmm. and doesn't get through the blood testes barrier. That's what stimulates spermatogenesis. So when you take exogenous testosterone, there's a feedback Mm -hmm. lowers your LH. That's enough, enough. We don't need any more. <laughs> yeah, lowers your LH, which lowers your <laughs> intratesticular testosterone production. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, a lot of people know that if you've been on testosterone for a while and you suddenly go off it, well, your testes are atrophied and they don't make as much testosterone yeah. on your own because you're basically just giving it exogenously and that, you know, just takes over mm -hmm. the work. But it, it tells your brain... There's too much testosterone, so stop making testosterone, you know, testes, stop making it. That's how that works. So, yeah, yeah. if you're worried about that, I guess enclomiphene is like your first line of uh, defense. Or Enclom and by the way, it's enclomiphene, it's a pill or is it injected? It's a pill. Too? It's a pill. It's a pill. Oh, that makes, that makes it much, much easier. Take, it makes right? it much easier. And you might be frustrated when I say this, but the doses that, that have been used in various studies for testosterone deficiency are also very, very different too. So, <laughs> yeah, but, well, um, but yeah, there's uh, the, the best non-testosterone drug, I think with the most evidence mm -hmm. is, is HCG, but it's expensive. But, but you need to inject it. So it also has its uh, downsides because as with any drug, if you can stick with using it, uh, it also plays a role when, and when you have to put a needle yep. into yourself it's, several it's, times a week. It it's very be... inconvenient. Injecting <laughs> HCG is very yeah, is right. um, not that big of a deal because you can use tiny uh, uh, insulin insulin needles, yeah, insulin, and insulin just needles. inject it into the subcutaneous fat of your abdomen or upper inner thigh, and it's mm -hmm. just like a pure liquid. So it, it goes in very, very easily. There's very little pain associated with it. Whereas, you know, testosterone yeah. is suspended in oil that's harder to administer, harder to push through the syringe. You have to use a larger bore needle. There's more pain. Needle, so it's not yeah. as big of a um, pain to inject as testosterone. But obviously, any mm -hmm. kind of injection is inconvenient. I should also say, by the way, you can use HCG with testosterone. I don't know if you want me to get into that level of detail or why you would do that. So yeah, yeah, to, to preserve to preserve the fertility while you're taking testosterone. It, you could so if you use injectable testosterone with HCG, what that will do is mm -hmm. preserve your testicular volume. Yep. Whether it preserves yep. your fertility, I mean, we think probably it does, but just not a lot of studies you know we know we have studies for example with specific doses of hcg in men that are on trt you know if, so for example 500 250 to 500 ius of hcg every other day while you're on a trt mm -hmm. dose of testosterone in the vast majority of men you will not get testicular atrophy and your sperm counts may in the trial that i'm thinking of which was done in japan it uh, 500 I use every other day while on TRT doses of testosterone. The men in the 500 IU group, actually their testicular volume, I think, increased by 7%. And their sperm counts did not decrease. I don't think they increased significantly. Mm -hmm. And then in the 250 IU group, they had very mild testicular atrophy. Like This is by or uh, um, orchiometry basically like a special device that measures the size of the testes. So they experience very, very small amount of atrophy. Yeah. Well, it's still a big difference between complete atrophy and uh, just small it is. decrease. So. It is. So if it's a, it, so the best evidence is just for the cosmetic concern of you don't want your testicles to shrink, mm -hmm. you know, then HCG can be used for that. Now, now, here's the important thing, though. Just because you're on HCG and testosterone and your balls don't shrink does does not mean that your fertility is preserved. Yeah, especially you're getting older, uh, things change. Well, yeah, well, also, j just because your, your volume is preserved, I mean, it may be the case that exogenous testosterone has other as-yet-to-be-discovered unknown effects that, mm -hmm. you know, reduce 
you know, sperm quality and things like that. I mean, probably it doesn't, but without a specific experiment designed to look at just that, it's really hard to say for sure. So bottom line is if you're really concerned about your fertility, you, you can't be on testosterone with or without HCG. There's no guaranteed way to preserve your fertility. But it appears to be it appears to be a very good way. But yeah, there is, there, there is a risk. There is a risk. Mm -hmm. I've seen men use this for this. Yeah, I've seen men use it for this purpose that their fertility, their balls still shrink, and their fertility, uh, you know, still goes in the toilet. That's a, very, a small minority, but I have seen it. Then I've seen guys that go on it, and you know, they Fine. have like three kids in the span of yep. two, three years. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. Highly individualistic, but it seems that HCG can help preserve testicular volume on testosterone. Yeah, so you, if you go, if you're young and you go on TRT, and uh, you should probably save your sperm somewhere in the sperm bank or something. Yeah, so that's another thing you can do is if you're worried about it, you know, you can bank sperm, you know, but then you're basically saying that if you lose your fertility, you're going to be doing you know, IVF and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But know. I mean, I'm just like as extra layer of insurance yeah that's an extra layer of protection and you can do that and that's part of uh the informed consent process as we educate people on sperm banking if that's important to them but hardly any men ever really do that it, it's one thing to make a conscious decision and right as other thing is oh you, i could have done that but i didn't it's kind of different uh, mentality you're, I'm you're, all for you're, intentional living <laughs> yeah you're 100 percent right exactly and now if you come to trt is it always inject? No, it's not always injectable, right? You can. There are also different varieties: creams, pills. Uh... There, there's a lot of different ways to get testosterone mm -hmm. delivered. The, the, correct. You can get it injectable, and mm -hmm. the injectable can be either intramuscular or it can be subcutaneous. Oh, it also can be subcutaneous, so you can use small needles. It also can be subcutaneous. Not also. It it can be subcutaneous, and. The accumulated the, the evidence is accumulating that the subcutaneous injection is superior to the intramuscular injection. Maybe so, because it's less invasive and people use it more. <laughs> well, it's le yeah, it hurts. It hurts. Yeah, it hurts less because you're injecting it into sub Q fat, and yeah. the its release is more. It has more predictable kinetics. Okay. So if you inject it into a muscle, it forms an oil droplet in the muscle, uh -huh. and the oil droplet gets released from the muscle. I don't know if you really want me to draw it out, or, but anyway, the oil droplet gets released from the muscle. The muscle metabolizes it to its active form, and then some of it goes into the lymphatics. Some of it mm -hmm. goes directly into the bloodstream, but it actually turns out that whatever muscle you injected into, if you then start doing a lot of exercise in that muscle, that causes a, yeah, a massive blood. amount of blood flow increase uh -huh. to that area that can affect the absorption kinetics of the, of the drug. So it's more unpredictable. Whereas mm -hmm. if you inject it subcutaneously, the depot or the oil droplet forms, it goes into the lymphatics and that has more predictable rate yeah, of release consistent. into the mm -hmm. circulation. Yeah. So okay. it's less painful, it's more pre predictable. And it probably has the best efficiency. Or, it's or best efficiency efficacy. because you can use a lower dose. So, mm -hmm. you know, I forgot the exact numbers, but like 100 milligrams of testosterone injected deep into an uh, intramuscular site, it, you know, you can get the same effect with like 85, 80 milligrams injected subcutaneously, if that makes sense. So you don't need as much. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's also cheaper and works better. It's like cheaper, awesome. cheaper works better, less painful, less painful, okay. more more convenient. So in the case of the sub Q injection, what you do is you get a, a an eighteen gauge needle, which is a huge needle. That's what mm -hmm. you use to draw it up from the vial, and then you mm -hmm. screw on a like a twenty five gauge needle, and then that you can inject subcutaneously. Whereas if you're injecting it into a muscle, you you use a lot the large bore needle to inject. <laughs> Oh, yeah, injected yeah, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. Definitely. Not, not not fun <laughs> yeah yep. so is those injections also like every other day uh, you do it to yourself or you go to a clinic 
So the pa the package insert, uh, the FDA trials and stuff, they, they say if you look in the physician's drug reference, you if you're using like testosterone, cypionate is by far the most common ester of testosterone that's prescribed mm -hmm. in the U.S. They say you should you should start with like a dose of even as low as 25 to 50 milligrams every two weeks. Every okay, two I weeks. will tell you that there are no expert physicians that prescribe it that infrequently. At minimum, they mm -hmm. prescribe it once a week, but the vast majority of us are prescribing it starting at least twice a week. So you're talking about Monday and, and Thursday. Yeah, that makes sense because otherwise you'd have too much and then too little and you go on the roller coaster of... Uh, yeah, so what happens is if you inject two, let's say your dose is 200 or let's say it's 100 milligrams a week or let's just say it's 200 milligrams every two weeks. If you compare two, the 200 milligrams every two week dose to, the, to let's say 100 milligrams a week mm -hmm. to... 50 milligrams twice a week twice a week yep the 50 milligrams twice a week you'll get more persistently elevated levels you get lower yeah, yeah. lower spikes in levels but you get more mm -hmm. consistent levels within the normal range whereas that 200 milligram dose that you injected two weeks ago by the time you know eight nine ten days passes your levels are probably sub therapeutic again so yeah yeah that, that again makes sense because initially you'd go over the normal levels and then they're going to drop below the normal levels. Right. So I, I, do you need to go to a clinic to have this injection, or you just do it at home on your own? No. Uh, well, <laughs> you can do it on your own. It's it's not mm -hmm. a, a problem at all to do it on your own. It's very easy to learn how to do it. You can learn how to do mm -hmm. it in, you know, five minutes. A yeah. lot of TRT clinics in the U.S. have men come in and their nurses inject it just so they can charge them money to do it because yeah, people yeah, just thing. It's, it's extra time and extra money yeah Pe people naturally just don't want to inject themselves they just think oh i should do this at the doctor's office but no you can do it you I can mean, learn how to do it on your own so don't let the let these clinics tell you that you have to come in for your injection people on insulin inject themselves all the time people on insulin inject themselves all the time but I mean, insulin, you're usually injecting three, four times a day, five times mm -hmm. a day if you're using short-acting and long-acting insulin. Yeah. So it's not practical to go to the, the clinic. You could go to the clinic even if you're on twice a week and they can inject you, but it's a pointless, stupid thing to do because it's a very easy thing to do. So no, what, like, why spend the money mm -hmm. to do it? You could learn how to do it yourself, and it's really no big deal. What about pills and creams? Uh... I would, they, of course, it would have more, much more variability because so, absorption. So, so uh, yep, there, there are. So aside from injections, there are, there are pills, there are patches, there are gels, there are creams. Mm -hmm. Yep. The patches and gels and, and and the commercially available creams are not good. They don't consistently produce. Uh, well, I should say they will get levels consistently, uh, you know, higher and everything, but there's much more v uh, individual variability. Like there are some men that just don't hardly absorb any transdermal testosterone okay, okay, at okay. all. But for some people, it actually they, they actually work. So correct, can, yeah. For some people, it works. It. The best, mm -hmm. in my opinion, this is just my opinion. If if you don't get it from injection, then the next best way to get it is probably from a compounded testosterone cream that's put mm -hmm. in a base that you can apply directly to the scrotum. And the reason mm -hmm. that you apply it directly to the scrotum, you don't want to apply it on your arm or even your inner thigh, is, you know, that's where it get, you can get the, the most absorption. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the problem is the compounded creams you have to apply twice a day. And mm -hmm. the biggest problem with the compounded creams is there's a risk of transference. So you have to wait three to four hours after applying it, even if it's well absorbed and you don't see any on your skin. You can't mm -hmm. come into contact, for example, with a female sexual partner because you'll transfer it. Okay, yeah, yeah, because they, they, they have too much, they'll get too much. <laughs> Correct. And especially you don't want to come into contact with babies or pregnant women. Yeah. And it's a twice a day type of thing. So you have a three hour window in the morning and a three hour window in the evening. You can't mm -hmm. have any contact with that part of your body. And so if you imagine you, you're getting on testosterone because you have sexual dysfunction, yeah. well, now you've really reduced the amount of time that you can actually use that part of your body. <laughs> it's 
counterproductive a little bit. Yeah, counterproductive. So what about pills? So pills, there are there are pills that are being developed. Uh, the early one of the earliest ways to get testosterone was in a form called methyl testosterone, which was a pill, but. Mm-hmm. It had to go through first pass metabolism in the liver, and it co- it caused liver damage. And then something new which bypasses liver. Yeah, so there are new there are newly developed forms of testosterone that are designed not to be metabolized in the liver. Mm-hmm. Problem with that is you have to take them multiple times a day, and the studies on it are not yet really conclusive um, as far as the effects that you get from it, and they they have unique properties and how they interact with the gastrointestinal tract. It, I mean, we we do know about the oral and the creams as they produce less uh, red blood cell increases than the injectable. And mm-hmm. they typically also tend to produce less estrogen, you know, because some of the testosterone that you take gets converted to estradiol. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people say, oh, that's great. But a lot of benefits from testosterone come from also increasing your estradiol levels, contrary to widely popular belief. Mm-hmm. So that is probably not necessarily a good thing. But yeah, those are the, I guess, theorized or marketed benefits. There's a lot of oral testosterone products being sold by compound pharmacies that you'll see ads for on Facebook. You know, you need to be careful about those because in addition to we don't know the outcomes with with oral testosterone all that well yet we also don't know based on the all these pharmacies making it themselves are they really making a good product or good not quality, yeah yeah yeah, right, yeah. Right. so so we don't know so so i would say you i don't ever prescribe the oral form the way i try to get people on the injectable subcutaneous mm-hmm. that's by far i think the best way to do it and then if they want to do it intramuscularly for whatever reason <laughs> i mean then they can do that and then I back back the next option is like a compounded cream. And then, you know, but the pills and stuff and the intra, there's an intranasal spray too that is super expensive and you have to give it five times a day. You know, I would stay away from patches, gels, and non compounded creams. Why not? Why not patches? I mean, I know that women use patches all the time. Uh, Patches in most studies of men with hypogonadism haven't been shown to have good outcomes, even if they raise the testosterone levels. Like there are studies that look at diabetic men that use intr- mm-hmm. that use injectable testosterone and then use transdermal patches, and they'll get the men in the treatment group to the exact same testosterone to the exact same increase levels. and levels, but the patch studies show sometimes no actual beneficial effect, whereas the injection ones do. So, and then there's also the variable absorption. The absorption with patches is even more oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sketchy yeah, than even on your skin. creams. Yeah. But is there, is there any good explanation why is that? So we just don't know. I think it has to do with an individual's just the properties of their skin and how much gets absorbed. The other mm-hmm. problem with the skin is it has a very high amount of of the five alpha reductase enzyme that converts the testosterone into DHT. And so if you convert a lot of the testosterone into DHT, you don't get a lot of the benefits of the testosterone and potentially you get some of the bad effects of elevated DHT. But you know, that's the problem. By the way, that's also why creams are recommended to be administered vaginally in women because it's not the testosterone that fixes the sexual dysfunction so much as it is the DHT. And in women, the highest amount of the 5-alpha reductate, or I should say the highest concentration of that enzyme is found in the vaginal mucosa. Mm-hmm. So, but that's the reason. So that's just another reason why the patches and creams are, are I think, far inferior to the injectable forms. The thing that we've now realized with all these forms of testosterone is they need separate outcome studies because we're mm-hmm. finding inconsistencies between the different forms. Is even if you get people to the exact same levels, if you're using a different form, you may not get the same outcome. Interesting. So it sounds like I mean, if you're going to be on TRT for you know, like 40 years of your life, there is a lot of room to experiment. There's a lot of room to experiment. 
There's also, uh, within the injections, by the way, there's different, you can use longer acting esters of testosterone that only have to be injected every few weeks. The, like there's something mm -hmm. called testosterone undecanoate, which is an 11 carbon, it's a very lipophilic, long, basically, you know, much slower metabolized form of testosterone that's used like in research slow trials. Release. <laughs> yeah, slow mm -hmm. release. They use it in research trials because you can ensure the men take it. That has to mm -hmm. be given in the clinic because it has to be injected deep into the muscle and mm -hmm. it carries a low risk of what's called pulmonary oil microembolism, basically just cause a spasm of cough and which can be quite severe. Yeah. Um, so that has to be done in the clinic and you have to be observed. But they like it in research trials just because it's only every few weeks and you can definitely tell if the subjects are taking it because you're administering it yourself. There's also pellets, which are basically, uh, you know, things that implant, you implant into the skin and are slowly released over time. Oh, it's almost uh, like an advanced insulin pump. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's very, it, it's seen as very convenient. The problem mm -hmm. is the variability in the levels that you get with it are very wide. And what we're finding is men who get, first of all, the Trocars that you use for the pellets in men are, are huge, so it's a painful procedure. It usually goes into the gluteal muscle or the lower back, and yeah, it will elevate your testosterone levels. There's wide variability in how well they work, and the biggest problem I'd say with them is by the time you need a new pellet, you've probably spent at least a month or a month and a half with very low testosterone levels. So the idea with the pellet is, oh, yeah, we get a slow release of testosterone and maybe that's somehow beneficial and lower side effects. And that that is true that it, it, it releases more slowly. So maybe you think mm -hmm. that's better. But you have to remember that your brain, your testes, your brain, your testes don't coordinate slow tonic releases of testosterone. Your testosterone is really designed to spike at certain times of the day and then yeah it should you know, follow probably circadian rhythm and probably some pulsating rhythm from your brain uh, correct well. correct yeah. so the pellets are really bad they're also really mm -hmm. expensive and yeah. like i said painful and not a good option for men okay, or I women i don't think so right now what about what about dhea we kind of mentioned it that it also plays a role DHEA has been... Has Do you address been, it in any way or not at all in this whole process? DHEA is... The problem with DHEA is because it's an over-the-counter supplement, there mm -hmm. are so many scam uh, clinics and people that sell it in, in as a way to get around using testosterone. So people think that, you know... <laughs> People think that just, you know, taking the supplement, you, you know, they try to say it's the same thing just because DHEA uh, gets converted into um, testosterone. It gets converted into uh, androstene dione and then gets converted into testosterone. And the enzyme that does that is an enzyme called 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. We know that DHEA plays a role in aging. We know that DHEA obviously plays a role in skeletal and, and, and muscle maintenance and stuff, but we're not just really sure about it. The only thing we know with high confidence is that DHEA given to men will not really raise their testosterone levels, despite the fact that DHEA in the body does get converted to testosterone. So... Yeah, there's no evidence to say that people should really take DHEA. It has been studied for certain diseases like rheumatic disease, but, you know, it's just a testosterone precursor. And obviously the way that it works when we give it to people is probably very different than the way it works just naturally in the body uh, when it's yeah, produced when, when by it's the... naturally synthesized. When it's naturally syn synthesized by the uh, adrenal gland and, and gonads mm -hmm. and even in the brain too. So. so maybe in a way you want some precursors to D, to to DHEA so then it can work normally, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's just the DHEA. Like I said, it's All right. like exogenous. Another, another DHEA, level of uh, yeah may not be that good. Also, m monitoring mm -hmm. DHEA levels is a bit complicated too because you can't directly measure them. You have to measure sulfated DHEA. I don't know yeah, if you want to get into that level. Of well, detail okay, okay. and a if DHEA's primary primary clinical utility mm -hmm. is mostly in women who we think have what's called polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
So it's a diagnostic thing. It's not necessarily a Something that you treat therapeutic just, uh, thing yet. Okay. And as far as, you know, exogenous DHEA in men is somewhat questionable. But you will find, you will definitely find a lot of naturopaths that say you need, your, your optimal DHEA sulfate levels are 400, 500, which coincidentally is the level that you uh, will get only if you take their expensive supplement, supplement. five times a day. Yeah. Exactly. Are there any side effects to we should cover to TRT to we already said mentioned all the shrinkage you might have? Yeah, there, I wish I, there's you know, we could say there's absolutely no side effects to testosterone, but of course that's not true. Exogenous <laughs> testosterone, the biggest side effect is like I said the fertility because it shuts down spermatogenesis if you give it. Mm -hmm. So if fertility is a concern, it will definitely cause infertility. So there are side effects that most doctors believe it causes, but there's no, there's not good evidence that it causes those side effects. But fertility mm -hmm. is one of the ones that is real. Another yep. one that's widely believed is that testosterone may cause prostate enlargement or worsen uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And for mm -hmm. decades, it was thought potentially even increase your risk for prostate cancer. The reason is because one major contributor to prostate enlargement in the case of BPH is DHT. So it was thought you give exogenous testosterone, a certain amount of that gets converted to DHT, your DHT mm -hmm. levels go up, your prostate enlarges, and yep. potentially you have an increased risk of prostate cancer. Now we have, we have numerous studies to show not only does testosterone therapy not increase your risk for prostate cancer, it's questionable whether it incre whether it worsens lower urinary tract symptoms when you have an enlarged prostate. So if your prostate enlarges, obviously that you know will make it harder to urinate because it mm -hmm. you know, you know yeah. impinges Pressure. on the urethra. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in some men maybe it does. Uh, not good evidence, uh, but there's even evidence that it improves it. But not only mm -hmm. does pro does testosterone replacement not increase the risk for prostate cancer, it probably lowers the risk for prostate cancer and if you happen to to get a pro, to get prostate cancer possibly it even makes it likely that you'll you're more likely to survive it's all that's also confusing because the, the treatment of prostate cancer they, there's something called bipolar androgen therapy where you like lower testosterone levels profoundly yeah, yeah. and then raise like them <laughs> massively yes yeah. so, but the key thing is it's so a lot of physicians think that it causes prostate cancer and worsens prostate enlargement, but in the case of prostate cancer, it doesn't cause it doesn't mm -hmm. increase your risk for prostate cancer. It probably lowers it, and in the case of enlarged prostate, there's no good evidence that it worsens pro prostate enlargement, and it, there's some evidence that it may improve it over time. My guess is that anything that improves your metabolic health should decrease the general yeah, exactly. cancer risk. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Other potential side effect that people think is it, it may increase your risk for blood clots. Uh -huh. okay? okay. The the evidence that it does that is, again, it's not very good at all. But it's an ex mostly an extrapolated belief from estradiol, which certain forms of exogenous estradiol can transiently increase your risk for blood clots, or at least studies have shown that it may slightly increase a woman's risk for blood clots if they're, you know, they're on postmenopausal hormone therapy. And so a lot of doctors think, well, because estradiol can do that, which the concern is massively overblown with estradiol too, but they think estrogen does that. So testosterone gets, some of it gets converted to estrogen. So that also therefore increases blood well, clot right. ri risk in men. Evidence for that, not high. Uh, another thing that's potentially, which is separate from testosterone, may be directly increasing blood clot risk and, and the way that, you know, clots form is that testosterone increases your red blood cell count. And it's mm -hmm. thought that past a certain, uh, you know, it, your Threshold hemoglobin again. and hematocrit, if it raises it too much, that increases the viscosity of your blood. And so if your blood viscosity increases, that may separately also increase your risk of blood clots. The evidence for that is also very poor, but a lot of doctors believe that that's a potential risk. Is it something you need to test for potentially just to know where you are before you started? 
Well, in the case of testosterone raising your red blood cell count, all you do is monitor someone's hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. Oh, yeah, so it's, it's just basic metabolic test. Uh, it's very basic tests. And, okay. you know, depending on, this is a problem, uh, intramuscular testosterone causes more erythrocytosis than does other mm -hmm. forms of, of testosterone, even sub-Q injected mm -hmm. testosterone. So it, right now the guidelines say if someone's hematocrit gets above about 54%, they either need their testosterone dose lowered or they need to donate blood. Do what's called therapeutic phlebotomy. Yeah, go donate blood. Yep, yep. Um, but by reducing someone's red blood cell count, do we are we lowering their risk of blood clots? The vast majority of doctors believe that. The evidence for that is 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 very 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 poor. And there's a lot of reasons to believe that it would that you know it probably does not increase your risk for blood clots. And the, there's some latest epidemiologic data and association things where, yeah, testosterone is not really associated with an increased risk for, for blood clots. So Yeah, my guess is if you keep it in the normal physiological ranges, there should not be any you know, specific side effects. Unless you go over 1,000, then, yeah, you probably go over your normal physiology and then... Uh, Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, that's true. It's, it's, it, you know, so this is where I differ from a lot of doctors is because, you know, I do a lot of the latest research and stuff. Yes, you will get the higher the dose of testosterone, the, the, the more erythrocytosis you'll tend to get. But number one, there's no actual evidence that that's harm that that's harmful. Mm -hmm. We know that if you live above an ele elevation of like 33,000 to 3,500 feet, you also have an elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit. And those people don't have increased risk for blood clots. Something that was very confusing is for many years in med school textbooks, they listed polycythemia as a side effect of testosterone treatment. The term polycythemia it, it, it was used as a synonym for erythrocytosis. So polycythemia means you get an increase in red blood cells, an increase in platelets, an increase in white blood cells. Polycythemia actually is a bone marrow cancer. It's it's the, mm -hmm. the real the the long form term of it is polycythemia rubra vera. Now in those patients, if you decrease their red blood cell mass through phlebotomy, you lower their risk for blood clots. That is true, but polycythemia vera is totally has a totally different disease mechanism than does testosterone. Testosterone increases your red blood cell mass through a totally different mechanism having to do with gastric iron absorption and erythropoietin, which is a hormone that stimulates red blood cell production. That is not the case in polycythemia. But because for so many years you had med school professors using those terms interchangeably. <laughs> Same terms, yeah. They, they get a bad, bad vibe. <laughs> it's caused, it's caused a lot of confusion. So testosterone does not cause polycythemia. It causes secondary erythrocytosis, meaning it just raises your red blood cells. There's no good evidence that that increases your risk of blood clots. But on the same hand, you know, donating blood is also extremely it safe. Might be a good thing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, why not? <laughs> you know what uh, I mean? It's, by the way, something you mentioned, does it mean that you also need to watch your iron levels, ferritin? You don't necessarily need to measure iron being too high. You need to measure mm -hmm. the iron in people when you check their hemoglobin, when they're on testosterone, to ensure that when you send them for every three to four month blood donations, you don't cause iron deficiency. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So side effects, we talked about infertility, prostate. Uh, the red blood cell and and blood clot risk. Another thing is cardiovascular risk. This is a very this is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest fears of doctors and why they're so, we're so scared of testosterone for a long period of time is it was thought that testosterone would increase your risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, primarily heart attack and stroke. It it turns out that the evidence that we have on that is. Not only does it not increase your risk of those things, it lowers <laughs> your risk of those things, especially if you are very deficient to begin with. Mm -hmm. Actually, low testosterone levels are highly associated with major adverse cardiovascular events.
it is still a widely thought fear that mm -hmm. you know testosterone increases your risk of heart attacks and so a lot of you know there's still a black box warning on, on it you know st still a lot of patients suing doctors because they're on testosterone and they get heart attacks but the evidence for that is to the contrary it, it it reduces your risk of heart attacks and strokes it does not increase your risk and the more deficient you are when you start treatment the mm -hmm. the, the the greater your risk reduction from treatment it probably also stems from the gym and overuse and the bad outcomes there versus staying in the physiological dose and improving your metabolic health mm -hmm. completely two different stories Right. So, yeah. So we, so I guess we, I guess that's an important point is the studies on heart. There was one that was just released two, a year ago called the Traverse trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and people can look this up. It was in the published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there was a really popular podcast just released a couple of days ago with Peter Adia and, and Chris yeah. Williamson, mm -hmm. where they talk about the, the Traverse trial. And basically what the Traverse trial was, was a study that looked at Unfortunately, they used transdermal testosterone and, and looking in to see purely if men on transdermal testosterone had a higher incidence of heart attacks and, and strokes than people who were not on it. So it's what's called a non-inferiority trial. It was not designed primarily to look at symptom outcomes. It was designed primarily to look at is giving someone a mild dose of testosterone, does Safe. it raise their risk yeah. of heart attacks? And the answer to that with the transdermal testosterone is no. There's a lot of limitations and stuff to the Traverse trial. Um, it's making, it's made doctors a lot less scared of testosterone, but well, I guess it's you know, don't, don't tell yeah. them the secret that that trial has almost nothing to do with most men at TRT clinics because we don't really use transdermal testosterone. It range is different, right? Yeah, and we and we do not and we when we usually have people with uh, we usually have their testosterone significantly higher than what they did in that trial. But that trial, you know, showed that over a period of many years there were not greater heart attacks in the testosterone treated group. Well, I guess it's good news anyway. Yep, and that's, you know, that that's you know, that's just one of the major trials that's been done recently on cardiovascular risk. It's so. almost like a phase, almost like what, phase one? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Now we need to increase well, the dose and see what happens. So in the in that podcast I, I mentioned, I think mm -hmm. they were criticizing the, the, the trial for not using high enough doses of testosterone. But Which again, like I said, the purpose, they don't, I don't think he understood that the purpose of that trial was not really therapeutic so much as it was to gauge risk. So that trial, the true importance is it, it, it lays the groundwork to now use higher doses of testosterone and see what those risks are. Because what they'll say is uh, to the, their institutional review boards is, okay, we used a mild dose. We didn't go past these levels. That didn't appear to increase heart attack risk. So now let's raise the threshold, give people an even higher dose, and let's see if that higher dose is associated with more heart attacks. So that'll be the next study probably that's done. Unfortunately, the, these studies just take so long. So we talked about, you know, the, those cardiovascular risks, blood clots. There's this popular belief that testosterone may cause mood swings or make you more aggressive. That's again, an extrapolated risk from studies showing that men with higher testosterone levels, specifically mm -hmm. studies done in prison inmates, the inmates with higher testosterone levels tended to be the ones with more antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy, you know, violent tendencies and things like that. So in other words, that was endogenous levels in a very specific population. As far as testosterone therapy increasing aggression and violence, there's, there's no evidence of that. What it does do, especially if you do it twice a week and you keep your levels steady versus. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the other thing that complicates it is, is there's a lot of anabolic steroids that cause, you know, mm -hmm. mood lability and, and, and stuff like that. And so people think that testosterone does the same thing. Um, but there's no evidence of that. What testosterone will do is increase your drive and motivation. And so I guess to the extent that you're a violent person, you know, to begin with, or your way of solving problems is like coercion and stuff like that. Testosterone does increase goal-directed 
you know, m motivation and activity and things like that. So maybe from that standpoint, it would increase it. But that, you know, you're already a kind of a, yeah, yeah, a yeah, coercive yeah. person. But as far as making a normal person like an enraged, violent uh, mm -hmm. person, there's no evidence that it does that at all. But it's a widely believed thing. Yeah, I guess it kind of circles back to what we have started with, that it, at least in my head, all those steroids, including testosterone, they were like one thing without any differentiation between the effects. And, and that's probably how it's, my guess is, uh, in a lot of people's heads. Yeah, that, that is it. Other side effects would be things like gynecomastia, would be, which would be breast tissue growth. There's, there's a lot of misconceptions in terms of gynecomastia. First of all, the vast majority of men think gynecomastia is their boobs get bigger. Okay, that they have more subareolar breast fat. That's not what gynecomastia is. Gynecomastia is where you have actual glandular tissue that grows underneath the nipple that you can feel mm. and palpate, and in most cases is very painful. People think that the reason that it, and first of all, it's, it, it does not happen uh, in every patient. It's a, it's a, it is an uncommon side effect. People blame it on estrogen, on testosterone raising estrogen levels because estrogen plays a role in, you know, proliferation of mammary tissue. It is not, strictly speaking, an estrogen effect. It probably has more to do with the ratio of testosterone to estradiol if, if it has to do with estradiol really so much at all. I mean, there's controversy whether TRT even really causes gynecomastia for there's more a placebo or, you know, effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but what happens, but anyway, so that's a side effect that a lot of people believe. Uh, I could get into a whole two day long discussion about gynecomastia just on its own. And then another side effect that's theorized or thought would be like worsening hair loss. So what causes male pattern baldness or androgenic alopecia is mm -hmm dihydrotestosterone, yep. obviously that's a metabolite of testosterone. So you increase your testosterone, it's thought you also increase your levels of DHT in the scalp. And so that may worsen hair loss and probably in, in some men it does. Well, not something I worry about. <laughs> yeah, so that, that may be potentially a, a concern, but those are really the those are really the main, okay. the main side effects and, and thoughts. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, want to start or investigate how, how do you approach the subject with a doctor? Is it to say, let's check my testosterone? Uh, so what, what, what is a typical sort of... What you want to do when you, you everybody should, st everybody who's concerned that they have testosterone deficiency should start by just going to their regular primary care doctor. Don't <clears throat> just jump to seeing someone like me or mm -hmm. any of these TRT clinics. <laughs> Just go to your regular primary care doctor, say, look, I, you know, I have a lot of my libido's low. It's lower than it used to be. My erectile function's not what it used to be. I'm very tired all the time. I can't focus at work. Then your doctor's probably going to focus on a lot of, you know, potentially other causes for those things. But you can usually convince them to at least check your levels because once mm -hmm. you have symptoms, that's when the levels become maybe useful. So you can get your doctor to check them, and then if you have levels that are below the threshold that your doctor thinks is acceptable, which is usually not based on evidence, but more on their perceived risk of of prescribing you testosterone if you have quote unquote normal levels. Um, mm -hmm. So you should start with that. Just give lay out your symptoms. At hey, I heard about testosterone deficiency, but I don't want to run to any you know these scam TRT clinics. And if you say scam TRT clinic, your doctor is going to know exactly what you're talking about most of the yep. time. <laughs> um, so usually they'll do it for you. And if your levels are, mm -hmm. are, are low, that, you know, they'll probably be the one that prescribes it. Usually, you know, like I said, they'll check two levels before then. But if you can get it from your regular doctor, that's obviously preferable to going and spending money at uh, another clinic, which sometimes they're going to try to sell you other stuff that you don't need. You should only not use your regular doctor if... You, if after having your symptoms investigated and seeing if there are other potential causes, it, they're just recalcitrant and won't give you testosterone, even though you meet the classic guideline definitions, there's still a lot of doctors that, that will do that. 
um, because they're scared of it, or they'll refer you to an endocrinologist or, or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the only time you should leave your primary doctor is if, you know, they do a, it, if they just tell you to go away, uh, definitely you should get a new doctor. But if they, you know, if you don't have a satisfactory resolution based on the tests that they do and, and the whatever treatment they give you, then yeah, then that's when you will want to see basically someone like me. A specialist, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, just saying, you know, the side effects, the, the good thing about the Traverse trial and these other, you know, maybe not as well uh, done studies we we'll want is it's raised awareness in just the regular primary care doctor about the fact that te mm -hmm. testosterone deficiency is a, is a huge problem. And so compared to 10 years ago, a lot more primary care doctors are willing to at least check. They're willing to at least, you know, go down that road with you. Whereas in the past, they just, oh, please, you're just getting older. It's part of aging. Go away. Part of aging, yeah. yeah. Yep. So okay. I think just being honest is, is is fine. And a lot of doctors are pretty reasonable people. Yeah, I mean, you just need to talk with them. It's, you just need to talk with them. But, you know, I, I will say there's a lot of doctors that still don't want to deal with testosterone. Typically, it's older ones that still have the a lot of the education that they got 20, 30 years ago when it, mm -hmm. the Zeke guys was hormones are dangerous, hormones are bad in both men and women, stay away from hormones. So if they still have that kind of attitude, you're not going to get anywhere. But hopefully, if they have a little more of an evidence-based, you know, way of doing things, they'll at least explore it with you. So, but yeah, best right. to start with your primary care doctor. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Any final thoughts, additions, recommendations? Yeah, I, I would say don't ignore it. If you have the symptoms that we talked about, and especially if you're in middle age, you, you need to, to have your testosterone levels checked because it is at this point safe to say and accurate to say that living with low testosterone, enough to cause symptoms, is dangerous. It will shorten your life. So it's not something that you should ignore. It's not like the attitude shouldn't be, I'm going to go get on testosterone just because I want to feel younger and, and, and look better. And the attitude really should be, I want to have, have myself investigated for possible testosterone deficiency so I don't get chronic disease and I don't die early. And, you know, the looking and feeling better, you know, that's just a side benefit. I mean, it's a great side benefit, but the, the, it, it's a serious issue. You can live longer and better. You can live longer and better. Yeah. And, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing with postmenopausal women. Like if you have symptoms that are due to, uh, you, you know, menopause and you don't have any contraindications to, to being on estrogen replacement, then you should be on estrogen replacement because the accumulated evidence suggests that you have lower all-cause mortality. It's the same thing with testosterone. So don't think that it's just like a lifestyle thing or like, you know, this, this, this health fad. It's a real serious problem. Yeah, and good, good thing we have solutions. It's a, it's a problem with, with very, simple, very simple solutions. So where people can find you and more of you? Are you mostly on TikTok? Uh, yeah, they can find me on TikTok, you know, C. Bronson, MD. That's a okay, good, and I'll good leave link. links all to your uh, profile and hopefully uh, we'll see a book from you. Yeah, yeah. And it's... hopefully my book will be out in, in August. You know, like I said, it's designed to be just read by, read in mm -hmm. one or two sittings. And it's, it's just designed to list in brief form the benefits and the risks. All right, Chris. It was a yeah, discussion. hopefully that was useful. Um, uh, it was useful to me, so good. I hope good. it's going to be useful to a lot of people as well. Awesome. Well, thanks and for having me, and uh, yeah, look forward to talking to you again. And now you might be asking, how do I find such a doctor who is staying current with all the research, who is interested in prevention instead of over medication? Do they even exist? Last year, I was on a quest to find such a doctor for myself. And that's what this video is dedicated to. How to approach the search and what five questions to ask your potential PCP. Living is smart, aging is bad, so I highly recommend you watch this video next and take notes. So, I'll see you there.